Ephesians chapter 1. We didn't get through uh, two weeks ago uh, with our psalm. So we want to continue to look at Psalm 1 as we finish it. And just so grateful that um, Bill Wallace was able to step in and pinch it last week. Um, Because I know you would not have wanted me (laughs) here barking and hacking in the bad shape I was in last Wednesday night. It was not a pretty picture. Um, So we're going to continue looking at um, the concept of the law. It's so crucial in Psalms. And what's interesting is, um, and I guess I sort of knew this, but in getting ready for uh, these lessons that we're looking at here uh, in the book of Psalms, I was made keenly aware that there's three psalms that do not fit uh, all of the categories that some of the psalm writers have created over the years. And interestingly, all three of them have uh, an awful lot to say about the law. Psalm 1, uh, Psalm 19, and Psalm 119. Uh, And because of that, what Writers have uh, come to the point over the last few years, they will look at those three psalms and they call them the Torah psalms. That there's something about Torah that is so crucial that these three psalms develop uh, that we need to be... In fact, I was reading just a moment ago uh, before I came out here, uh, one person believed that um, that's why... In Psalm 1, as we've been studying, that you have this reference to the law because it's through the lens of Torah that you can only understand the book of Psalms. That only as you understand how the law played in the life of Israel, only then can you appreciate praises. Only then can you appreciate uh, doxology. Only then can you appreciate uh, even the view of God that is presented in the book of Psalms. But it's through the lens of Torah. And one thing that is rather interesting is that if we, um, if we limited our view of the law, uh, let's say just to Paul's writings, uh, the law, uh, according to Paul, has a much more negative take on it than you would fi- find it all in the book of Psalms. And I think one thing that's helpful for the Christian is that when you go back and you look at the Psalms, you get a much more balanced view of what law was. Because the way Paul uses the word law, there are times where when he uses the word, it's it's almost equal to the word we would use legalism. Now, not in every case, of course, but there are times when he uses it, he's aware that people have sort of distorted the law and created, as it were, their own righteousness and their own standing before God. So that what Paul is fighting is not the Torah of the Psalms, but what he's fighting is almost a misconstrual of what the law was intended to do to start with. Um, And so Paul's view of the law is quite a bit much more, I would say, antagonistic, of course, than the Psalms. (coughs) <coughs> Another good example of that is the book of James. James is rather interesting because uh, he calls love the perfect law of liberty. Uh, James has a very positive use of the word law. Um, it's not like Paul, of course. Paul's fighting some uh, deep controversies within the Galatian churches. Uh, but James, writing to what some people think, one of the earliest Christian congregations, precisely because he's going to use the word synagogue to talk about Christians assembling. And it's, it's a deeply Jewish word, and he's the only one in the New Testament that uses it to talk about Christians assembling. And so a lot of people feel that what that means is you've got probably one of the very earliest uh, Christian assemblies in Jerusalem that James is writing to. And that may be the case, but it's interesting in writing to such an early Christian group that has such a strong Jewish background, uh, he has a much more positive view of the law than Paul does in writing to Galatians. So that's just kind of a setting 
uh, to let you know that as we're going through uh, the Torah, uh, we're trying to get a much more balanced view. We've talked about in the past, uh, two weeks ago, about the ungodly, how that um, it begins and ends in this psalm with the ungodly. We talked about and we looked at verses uh, on how the ungodly work and how they pursue the kind of life that is not according to the will of God. Uh, we looked at sinners and we looked at the scornful. I was reading just a moment ago that also this idea of scornful um, it kind of has in its meaning uh, an element of pride and arrogance and that they delight in drawing people into their schemes that um, take advantage of other people. So the scornful and the mockers. And, and I also get the impression, though some of the writers don't say this, that another part of that is it's almost as if the scornful or the mocker also would be um, making fun of or sort of downplaying the role that God would be playing in your life. So that any uh, expression of faith and any expression of faithfulness is being mocked at or scorned by the individual. And I think that's probably the case. Um, when we look at the blessedness that's tied to the law, uh, we looked at this person's delight is in the law of the Lord. Uh, so let's, let's, look, let's start looking at that a little bit more closely. Look at Psalm, or I mean Proverbs, Proverbs 31, 13. And this is the end of uh, Proverbs where we have this wife of noble character. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands or delights in the work of her hands. It's interesting that this same word is used to talk about uh, her attitude toward what she does. Uh, not only... Uh, as kind of manual labor, but caring for her family and also going out and doing things uh, for her family. Proverbs 3.15. And it's, I also find it fascinating that this word is used in the wisdom literature. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. So here it's actually talking about the fundamental desires. What do you delight in? Well, if you delight in wisdom, it's more precious than rubies. And you can't find anything uh, any greater to delight in than in the wisdom of God. Uh, Psalm 107, verse 30. And this is the first chapter of book 5. Book 5 is 107 to 150. But 107... Uh, oh, this is interesting. He's talking about... Uh, the picture of sailors uh, in their ship. Um, <laughs> they were in the ship that mounted up to the heavens, went down to the depths. You can imagine this kind. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wits end. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. He guided them to where they delighted to go. It's interesting that in this kind of a setting where they're out of control and yet God is still there, um, the delight comes when they recognize the hand of the Lord. Psalm 111 and verse 2. Oh, this is a neat one. I, I like this one. 
Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Um, I discovered many years ago that I'm a ponderer. <laughs> I love to stop and think about things. <clears throat> That's why sometimes it's hard for me to go hiking 90 miles an hour through the, through the woods and the mountains um, because I see something and I like to stop and ponder. And if I'm by myself, I'll take my backpack and I'll have my little uh, notebook in it. And I'll, if I see something, I'll sit down and I'll sit and ponder and write a few things. And I realized after a while in my life that it's okay that I'm a ponder. Not everybody's a ponder and that's okay. But isn't it interesting that in this particular psalm, he says, greater the works of the Lord, they're pondered by all who delight in them. And, and that is true. If you delight in the works of the Lord, referring uh, to creation and some of the ongoing uh, things that happen because of the world that we're in, and you delight in what you see, then it causes you to think about them. And the implication is you reflect on the very one who made them possible. So it's, just, it's kind of a wonderful psalm there. But, it, but it's rooted in what you delight in. So the person who's blessed... That blessing is tied to the law in many different ways and dimensions. And then we talked a little bit last week about meditating and the actual word can mean to utter or mutter or ponder kind of under your breath. It's a little bit different than what we have conceived of it uh, in the West. Uh, apparently the practice was uh, when you meditated, you actually kind of um, under your breath would say of what you were saying loud enough so you could hear yourself. There were, I think there was the belief that hearing yourself say something was very, very important. I don't know if, if you've ever experienced this. Uh, you probably have. You've gotten so mad at yourself that you'll talk to yourself in the mirror. Have you ever had that experience? And, and what's funny is you almost feel like it's accomplishing something and you're hearing you tell yourself something. Um, as though we're aware of that dynamic. Uh, but to utter and to mutter, to ponder underneath your breath. Uh, and, it's, and it's directly related to the law itself. So that the very words of the law become part of your vocabulary, which is kind of a fascinating to think about. Now, as we continue then, uh, let's look at <clears throat> this particular meaning of Torah, that the one who is blessed is the Torah reveals the fruit of the blessed man. It's uh, the prospering of life. And first, um, it is based on covenant blessings that the fruit of my life, the outcome of it, is based on the fact that I am in a covenant relationship with God and I take that life seriously. Now, think about when I was studying for this lesson again, and you'll see the last slide when we get to it. Um, I kept thinking on a parallel track as it relates to the Christian life. Now we say this about the person uh, living in the time of the psalmist, that the fruit of one's life, we prosper, and it's based on covenant blessings because you are in a right relationship with God. Certainly we would say that was true for the Christian. Think of all the passages in the New Testament that talk about blessings for God's people. Now, they're not necessarily physical blessings. Uh, it doesn't rule them out, but it doesn't necessarily demand them. There's, there's a little bit of, there's some differences between, of course, the book of Hebrews goes into a lot of this, but there's differences between the old covenant that Israel had with God and the new covenant that one has with Jesus. In many of the blessings understood by Israel in the Old Covenant, it had to do with uh, territory, uh, crops, um, you know, making their fruit, um, flocks of animals reproducing. There was a whole lot of physical blessings tied to Israel's faithfulness. When you come to the New Testament, that emphasis shifts a little bit. So much so 
that there is a lot of New Testament passages on the place of suffering in one's covenant relationship with God. A lot of passages. Uh, I think of 1 Peter. Several passages in 1 Peter. I think of uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians where Paul has several passages on what he suffered. I think of what he wrote to Timothy. Just kind of a blanket statement. He goes, yeah, Timothy, everyone who lives a godly life will suffer. Like, oh, that sounds so final. I mean, couldn't he have backed off a little bit? Uh, well, Paul is, he's, he, he's exhibiting what I believe is, is quite a bit of a shift in our view of blessings related to the new covenant. And though this isn't my whole point of lesson here, uh, I think we see that and we get a little uneasy when we hear, uh, say, preachers and teachers, whether it's in person or on TV or whatever, um, promising all these physical blessings if you'll just be faithful to God. Well, the New Testament doesn't take that route. Now, like I said, it, it doesn't rule out blessings that can be serendipitous because you're faithful. But it, but it doesn't guarantee them either. And we have to understand that nuance. It's, it's, it's a big difference. Now, also, <clears throat> think about our covenant relationship with God as opposed to in the time of Israel. In your covenant relationship with God, um, that relationship was only for a certain group of people called Israel. Well, we begin to broaden our concept and this was hard for Israel, but we're in covenant relationship. We're in the kingdom of God with anyone else who is in covenant relationship with God. There are no ethnic geographical boundaries to the kingdom. That was a huge change. And so if we can, if we just kind of think about the way some of these things fundamentally change, uh, it can help us. At the same time as we're going through this, we can see some parallels for the Christian life. I really like this uh, phrasing in Psalm 1. Uh, Blessed is the man. Notice, the one who is planted. Let me see how it's worded in the NIV. Psalm 1. Mm -hmm. but he is like a tree planted by streams of water. Uh, the way this is worded, it is an intentional planting. It's, it's not as if somehow the tree sprung up, but it's an intentional planting. And look at Jeremiah 17, verse 8. Um. Uh, He's talked a little bit about Judah's sin, uh, but he also talks about the one who is blessed if they come back to God in faithfulness here in, in Jeremiah's prophecy. Look at verse uh, 17, chapter 17 of Jeremiah, and actually I want to read verse 7 first. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Sounds like Psalms, doesn't it? He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Sounds a lot like Psalm 1, doesn't it? So it sounds like that this imagery of being planted by the streams of living water and Israel's faithfulness and God's supplying everything that his people needed to uh, be fruitful in their life, that was sort of a common image. Uh, it certainly is in the Psalms and it is here in Jeremiah. And when we look at the source, so God intentionally plants his people by rivers of water. Now it's interesting, and, and here we're still dealing with metaphor, but he's referring to the source of life that the Torah or law can provide. See, if, if we were to, 
<laughs> if we were to do some multiple choices, if I put the word law up here, and we started having choices down through here, um, and we had, we had two choices to make. Is the law dry or is it like living streams of water? We say, well, I've looked at law books and they're as dry as they can be. So you check, you check law as being dry. Well, from the Psalms perspective, law is rivers of water. It's the source for life that God gives. Because what you're going to learn in Psalms, opening up in Psalm 1, you get to Psalm 19, and then particularly Psalm 119, is that law is connected to life. Law is God's instruction for life. Uh, maybe you've heard people express this. Well, I don't like these guidelines because it's taking all the fun out of it. And sometimes young people will say, well, you know, I hate my parents laying down the law because it means I can't have any fun anymore. What they don't realize is that the law as guideline is given for the best experience of life. Sometimes Israel, of course, didn't get that. And sometimes as Christians, we miss that. that. That scripture is not given to us to take the fun out of life. And a lot of people just kind of think that. Well, law was never intended to do that. It is the source of water. It's the source for life. And when we take that kind of spiritual guidance seriously, the implication is, and it's said in many different ways in the book of Psalms, you can't live a better life before God than one that is lived according to Torah. When you listen to God's instructions, and that's where your heart is, and you're following Him, pleasing God, and that's your desire, there's no better life on the face of the earth. Now, for some individuals, it takes them a lifetime to get there to agree to that. Uh, maybe you found that out sooner than later. That may be why you're here tonight. You found that out sooner than later. <laughs> but some individuals never learn that. But that's the function of Torah. Okay? And then there's another thing that's really fascinating with this timeliness of fruit. Um, the wisdom literature, of which Psalms is part of that, is so concerned about growth and spiritual maturity. So concerned about the growth of character. What does that look like? Uh, when I say that, um, I can use uh, an example that um, uh, Tom, for years, was involved in Boy Scouts. And with Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, there are pretty clear signposts as young men mature. You see their decision making, you see their uh, maturity, uh, accepting challenges, and of course that ultimate challenge, and I've been privileged since we've moved here to see probably three or four uh, Eagle Scout projects. They've actually shown me their notebooks. And those guys that take that stuff seriously, that's amazing. Uh, but that didn't happen overnight. It, it went through a process of maturing, learning. Uh, sometimes uh, I, <laughs> you think about the, the role of the scoutmaster having to kind of take that uh, resistant shopping cart and turn it in a direction it didn't really want to go sometimes. But that's part of maturing. And that's, that's what happens in the wisdom literature. It's very much interested in a person growing and maturing and getting to the point where your whole life is one that exhibits the very presence of God and the very will of God in your heart and life. Uh, boy, that, and we could, we could spend so much time on this. Growth and maturation. And if we had time, it would be interesting. I could give you some homework for next week. It, it would be interesting for you to reflect on how, how have you seen yourself grow in your Christian life, say, over the last decade or more? Can you put your finger on ways in which you're convinced that you have grown and matured? That's a fascinating question, isn't it? Uh, I heard someone recently say this, 
And of course, this, this gets close to what Paul says, but we don't like the way it sounds. You normally can't grow unless there's some kind of crisis you have to face. Well, I don't like the way that sounds because it sounds like too much trouble's ahead. <laughs> um, now, to be fair, you can, you can grow intentionally without crisis being present. But when a crisis occurs, it is an opportunity for you to grow. Uh, sometimes people don't, but it is, a, it is an opportunity to grow. And in the book of Psalms, you, you see all the different ways that David and the other writers will face crises in their life. And uh, sometimes it looks like they're really growing from it. Other times it looks like they're, um, they're really kicking against the prick, so to speak, because they can't believe they're having to go through this. Uh, and I'm wondering sometimes that may be part of growth. Uh, I've noticed that sometimes part of growing and maturing is to allow yourself uh, the permission to say what you're thinking. <laughs> now, now, you may not always want everybody around to hear you, but to realize where your brain is, what you're thinking, and what you're telling yourself, you also need to realize that God is right there in the middle of all of that. Um, and part of, part of this growth and maturation is allow yourself to be aware of where you are and uh, to be aware that God is in the middle of all of that. But the beautiful metaphor here is of the blessed life. I mean, he, he portrays this wonderful. Um, my wife, Nancy, has a green thumb. I mean, it's amazing. She can take something half dead, put it in the ground, and next week it's blossoming. However, there's two things that she does not have a green thumb on, and we, we discovered why. Um, she has some azaleas, and I'm trying to think of what the other bush is. I'll think about it a little bit. Come to find out, those two plants need more sulfur than anything. We didn't know that. We just thought miracle grow and water and other stuff, fertilizer, stuff you put around, it'd be fine. Well, not these two. And it, it, it's almost uh, the, the metaphor of something growing and having the right kind of conditions for growth are crucial for the blessed life. Uh, and, and this is what it causes each of us to think about. This is real serious. Think about how you have grown the most spiritually. What have been some of those resources you've taken advantage of? Maybe it was a special time where you were deep in prayer for hours on end, you didn't know you were gonna enter into that experience. Uh, maybe you read scripture for hours on end, didn't plan to. Maybe you were helping somebody for hours or days on end, didn't know that you were going to. So there's all different kinds of ways that, that God can use as resources to help us grow in the spiritual life that is the blessed life. And I think that's an amazing part of this. And this is a wonderful metaphor that he uses uh, for that. Also, the Torah acknowledges righteous relationships. You are either known or you are unknown by the Lord. And it gives us a destiny. Um, back in Psalm 1, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. This is a theme that's going to get picked up in several ways in Psalms. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. And here again, I would say, is one of those intangible blessings that's even true for the Christian. That I think it makes a tremendous difference for a Christian living a Christian life that if you believe God is watching over you, that indicates God's care. It indicates um, his resources he has available for you. God watches over the way of the righteous. <coughs> Notice earlier, uh, he talked about the way of the counsel of the wicked. We don't walk in that way. And by implication, the Lord doesn't watch over them like he does the way of the righteous. So this acknowledges the righteous relationships 
He says it's not so with the ungodly or, or the wicked. Now, he's going to use a metaphor about their plight before God. Look at Psalm 35, verse 5. And this is a fascinating uh, psalm because uh, David is pleading for God to come and stand on his side and contend with those who are contending with him. Uh, Take up shield and buckler, arise, come to my aid. Brandy spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to your soul, I am your salvation. And then... um, May those who seek my life be disgraced and put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back in dismay. May they be like the chaff before the wind, which the angel of the Lord driving them away. See, now he picks up that same metaphor in chapter 35. And in chapter 1, it's the, the metaphor of the chaff being driven away by the wind And notice in this psalm, it's very clear that the angel of the Lord is part of that process. And if you think about chaff with wheat, you throw it up in the air, the wind's blowing, well then the chaff gets blown away. And that's how how insecure, uh, that's how um, with lack of meaning and substance, the wicked are. Uh, That is a picture of their plight before God. And the psalmist, in talking about the Torah, the law, is very clear about the wicked. Now, one thing that's interesting is as we continue through the Psalms and we get to Psalm 119, there's going to be a whole list of words. And if I can think of it at the time, I'll provide that list. The list of words that describes the wicked and the evil. There's tons of words that he's going to use. And then the list of words that are are sort of synonymous with instruction, law, ordinance, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and so the wicked are those who walk against the way of the Lord, are those who don't appreciate all of God's instruction and his guidance for their life. Um, look at Psalm, or excuse me, look at Isaiah. This is Isaiah 41. 15. And this is in the second half of the book that we call the book of comfort. He's giving hope to his people instead of uh, punishment and cursing. But 4115. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. You will thresh the mountains and crush them or reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them. The wind will pick them up and a gale will blow them away. But you will rejoice in the Lord, the glory in the Holy One of Israel." And it's interesting because this has to do with the destiny of Israel as a nation, uh, not just an individual. And then if you look back in Isaiah 29, 5. But your enemies will become like fine dust, the ruthless hordes like blown chaff. And again, appropriating this metaphor of the chaff being thrown into the wind for those who are against Israel. Look up in verse one. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. Well, notice in verse five, he picks up that theme again. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Uh, There is a strong emphasis here of not standing before the Lord. Uh, You're not going to stand uh, before the Lord if you stand in the way of sinners. And you're not going to stand as a wicked person uh, in the judgment before God and come out on the good end of it. 
So there's an emphasis here of your standing before the Lord. And the assembly of the righteous. Sinners won't be in the assembly of the righteous. Now let's talk a moment about the righteous because uh, it is an important word. Uh, the way of the righteous um, can indicate several things. Uh, the way of the righteous means that you're following God's way and not your way. Uh, it doesn't have to do, and some people think that it refers to this. He's not really talking about uh, a life of perfection. I'm not talking about perfection, but it's a way of righteousness that follows God's guidance and the Torah and the law. Okay, and because of that, uh, notice that it is wrapped up in the assembly of the righteous, that God's people assemble together for various reasons. And I think that we... I don't know that I, I don't think I put them on the PowerPoint here, but let me read a couple of them because the assembly is crucial in understanding the life of Israel. Uh, let me see if I wrote some of these down. I was amazed, yeah, maybe I did. Yeah. Psalm 7, verse 7. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Psalm 26, verse 5. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. And then Psalm 26, 12. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. This is an interesting one because it's in 26 that both of these last two occur where that the psalmist is talking about the grounding for his life. Uh, on one occasion, he says, you know, I looked at the life of the wicked and it looked pretty good. <laughs> and he said, I just about got sucked in until I went into the assembly and the sanctuary and I saw their end and their destiny. There, for Israel, the, one, one of the purposes of the assembly was to constantly draw you back to what your grounding grounding was before God. Now I want you to think about that as sort of a function today. When we assemble as God's people, part of that is it helps us to keep ourselves grounded in who we are, uh, in the kind of life we have committed ourselves to, and the Christian life following Jesus Christ. There's, the assembly itself has a certain grounding to it that is crucial to the Christian life. Israel understood that. Israel practiced that. And so um, I think way too many Christians today have too flippant of a, of a concept of the assembly. Uh, I think there's a, a, and has been a huge reaction <laughs> in the past, like, okay, if you miss the assembly, you can't make it to heaven. It's almost like miss assembly, miss heaven, you know, kind of equation. Well. I think what got lost in all of that was God's design for the assembly. Think of how crucial it is for our grounding, our identity, who we are, what we've committed ourselves to, our faith that we embrace, the relationships we have in Christ. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And after a while, uh, you almost get to the point where you think, I can't imagine God having created a life experience for his people in any other way, being made the way we are as human beings. Uh, it's just such a blessing to be a part of the assembly. And if you ever get to the point where you rule that out in your Christian experience, I think you've ruled out a huge part of God's intent on how we live out that faith. Okay? And now, there are a couple other passages. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Think about what it is we praise when we get together. We don't praise ourselves. We certainly don't praise political uh, things going on in our culture. What do we praise? We praise God that we are being faithful to. We're praising God for who he is and what he has done. We praise God for the wonders of this world. We praise God. Well, look at the next one, Psalm 107, 32. 
Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the righteous. Psalm 149.1, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. So there was constant praising that went on as the assembly got together. Now think about how uh, this is parallel uh, to the Christian assembly. Isn't it fascinating that, and, and we say this a lot, and for good reason, a lot of our Christian faith has Old Testament foundation to it. Okay? Even if something that might seem as benign as the assembly. Now we don't do the same things in the assembly, but the purposes and the function of the assembly basically is the same. Basically is the same. And you'll find so much in the Old Testament that when, con when Israel congregated and came together as assembly, uh, one of the first things they did was praise God. Now, I'm sure that was done in song, as we find out. It was also done in praises. There are, it's interesting that both in Jewish and in Christian assemblies, early ones, uh, there were praises that were spoken out loud may have been chanted, but they were praises and not just hymns or songs. But they were praises for the very God uh, that made it possible for them to be his children. Uh, of course, that's not the only purpose of the assembly, but think of how fundamental and basic this is. Okay, so as we conclude tonight, the Torah or the law is, is a foundational concept in Psalm 1. Which, which sort of gets us ready for how we can view all of the Psalms. It instructs which pathway to follow. Um, again, think about how the Christian way of life picks up on that. Uh, there is the straight and narrow way. There's the broad way, Jesus says in Matthew. Uh, the Torah reveals the heart of the blessed man. Now remember, I, I said this earlier, this is probably three or four weeks ago, and we don't have a lesson on this, but boy, it could be a rich one. You cannot believe how many times the idea of a person's heart is mentioned and talked about in the book of Psalms, all over the place. And it makes you aware that one of the fundamental themes of the Psalms is answering the question, where is my heart before God? Fundamental question that the Psalm answers. And so it the blessed life is where, uh, or the Torah itself reveals the heart of the blessed man. The Torah also reveals the fruit of a blessed man. That person's life is one in which not only is like the tree planted by the rivers of water, but also it's the life that the Lord watches over and that that particular individual uh, blesses God, praises God, experiences God in the assembly of the congregation. And then acknowledges righteous relationships. The Torah instructs us to live the life of the righteous with the godly, not the wicked, not the sinner, not the scornful or the scoffer. And so when we end, as we think about this, think of how Jesus embodies Torah and actually expands all of these. Because Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. And so what he's gonna do is take this idea of guidance and instruction and sort of embody it in such a way that no human being ever could. But we look to Jesus as guidance and instruction, which gives life. It's amazing, isn't it? Let's end with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we come to you tonight thankful for your Torah, thankful for providing the way of life before us that can give us life, thankful that because of Jesus' life, we're now like the tree planted by the rivers of water. Lord, help us to walk in the way of the righteous, the godly. Help us to be very much aware of the role of the Christian assembly in our life before you. And just how rich and blessed that is 
for us to experience. Thank you, God, that we've had this opportunity to open up the Psalms and begin to look at them from the perspective of Torah and what the blessed life is. We know that without you, none of this could be possible. So we praise you and we ask that you help us to live this out every day. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight.